So in our selection of talks, actually, uh, Paul is a, a keynote speaker. So he submitted, and uh, I decided as, a, as chair of the uh, program committee to, uh, to select his talk, um, which is slightly a bit of topic from uh, BotConf, um, because he's going to talk about a specific transport protocol. Um, but actually, uh, we, uh, uh, we thought it would be interesting to, to have this talk about uh, the, the, this protocol that has, has been uh, uh, worked on since 2013, I guess, and is starting to, to have uh, applications, RFCs, and so on, since a couple of years ago. And, so, and, and it might have a number of security uh, implications. And maybe you can discuss with uh, Paul about the... Uh, the use by the, the bad guys of, uh, of that protocol. So you have the floor. You can take a mic. Hello? Close? Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for having me back. It's been a few years since I was at a BotConf. I uh, really enjoyed it. And I'm uh, meeting some new people and some old friends. This is uh, quite an honor. I appreciate it. Um, let me say... The work I'm going to describe uh, did not really come from Amazon. I happen to work at Amazon, so it's, that's the name on the slides. Uh, but it's safe to say they don't know I'm here and that the company uh, does not have a position on this, but I do. And my co-author, Ben April, stand up briefly, uh, the tall dude back there, uh, he and I worked together at Farsight Security for quite some years, and uh, this work sort of came out of that time. Um, but, you know, it's not intellectual property or anything, so I don't think the, uh, that that corporation really cares that I'm here either. Um, so some of you may have seen earlier evolutions of this material because uh, it's been a slow-rolling uh, event for the Internet industry. And um, I apologize for anything that bores you because you've seen it before, but I promise that this is, uh, has been... Uh, continually revised. Um, so what's happening is that what people used to use Tor for, the onion router, is about to be the default transport protocol characteristic of the internet itself. So the idea of end-to-end -end opacity uh, is something uh, devoutly to be wished for by a whole bunch of people. Um, those people, generally speaking, have more time to go to the IETF and talk about what they want to do than, than you have, or than your average enterprise user or the supply chain that enterprises depend on. Um, we have generally not been in the room because uh, it, you know, you'd need maybe two full-time equivalent employees worth of resource just to spend on making sure that your point of view was represented in the outcomes. Um, Turns out that uh, those resources are not available. So first, I'll give you a short uh, overview of Quick itself. Um, it was created at uh, Google by a guy named Jim Roskind, who's like me, also at Amazon now. Um, and it was, you know, to solve the problem that uh, TCP seems to be really narrow and really slow and really uh, slow to change, um, difficult to change. Uh, so it was sitting there at the time that Edward Snowden famously made some disclosures of some national security material and flew to Hong Kong in 2013. And uh, those events were a big deal. Um, a huge number of people in the world, in particular uh, the people who were teenagers at, in 2013 and who are 20-somethings now, uh, said uh, this is an outrage. The idea that the NSA is spying on us and they're putting passive optical splitters and they're doing all of their, they're redirecting our FedEx shipments and adding, you know, hardware and software to our routers. Uh, this shall not stand. Well, you know, if, if you were older than that, you understood that governments uh, have their own rules and they play by those rules and that's the way nation states are, you can't change them. So this is the way the world works and it's the way the world has always worked and uh, something I'll talk about at the end is that this is how the world will continue to work. Um, 
Nevertheless, uh, there was outrage. And so um, this idea of quick was, uh, you know, again, originally it was to move the uh, transport protocol out of the kernel where it is hard to evolve it because you need your kernel vendor to incorporate whatever change to TCP uh, and has recently been, you know, put forward as an RFC or an RFC draft. Uh, and then you have to do a rolling up to upgrade. You have to deal with maybe different characteristics in your monitoring and your performance management and so forth. So uh, TCP as a logic uh, was seen as having uh, just a lot of inertia. And so the idea was if we can move all that stuff into user mode, we'll put it into a shared library or even statically link it to our binary, and then we are not hostage to the speed of TCP evolution by our kernel vendor. Um, and I suppose you could implement TCP in user mode, but uh, that would require opening what's called a raw socket, which requires a lot of privileges. And so, um, you know, your browser probably doesn't have those privileges. So that was not, not chosen. What was chosen instead is to build a thing that does mostly what TCP does and then some. In other words, a reliable protocol that, uh, you know, if you send something, it will reliably get to the other end in the order that you, that you transmitted it. And, um, and yet this is all done using UDP sockets that are not privileged. And so the kernel is completely unaware that this is happening. Uh, that has implications on all of you who like to uh, put malware into a torture chamber and uh, watch what it does. Uh, in particular, there is no connect system call that you can put a breakpoint on, uh, nor is there an accept system call. In other words, if you wanted to know what is the malware trying to do, gee, I'd love to know when it's making a connection, that it is making a connection, and I'd like to know where it's connecting to, and uh, then I'd, I'd like to kind of watch the TLS start up and all the rest. Uh, that becomes impossible now because the only thing the kernel will see is a write or a send system call uh, and the corresponding uh, read or receive system calls. And the payloads of those system calls has been well encrypted. And so uh, I'll come back to the idea of, uh, you know, what we're going to do to torture malware in a quick world. Uh, but I just want to say these implications are not lost on the people who are pushing for this. Because what a malware reverse engineer wants to do is the same thing in many cases as some national security agency of some government would want to do. Whether it's your government or another government doesn't seem to matter. It's, uh, and you know, I, I can understand the desire to have uh, the ability to have whispered conversations that the government cannot monitor and you know, decide whether you are committing treason. Uh, and so there's a whole spectrum of political argument that can be made, and I'll be at the bar later if you want to make it. Um, so the thing that, uh, that this team did not realize is that uh, the internet did not used to have ISPs. It used to be that we each built our own networks for our company or our university or our, if we were early connected from home. And we had to build some network and then figure out how to connect it to the rest of the world. But these are managed private networks. Everyone using those networks is an employee of that company, a student of that university, a member of that family. And um, those people are not victims of uh, devices like firewalls. In, indeed, they are customers of devices like firewalls. And um, I think it's safe to say that nothing about the design of QUIC uh, is meant to allow this way of life to continue. And I want to say, uh, somebody said to me, I don't know, last year or the year before, uh, Paul, the 1990s are calling. They want your firewall back. Um, all right. So I'll tell you why I still have a firewall, which is that it's been a long time since I was able to trust anything that I connect to my internal network, um, either because the supply chain may have been poisoned uh, the company who made that particular whatever um, uh, Linux kernel or whatever's in that IoT device is long out of business, or the company they bought it from is long out of business. There are no patches, that, you know, so it might just have old bugs um, that are well public, or have been well publicized, 
or it could have been poisoned by uh, somebody who is trying to gain access to secret places by putting code in places that can bypass perimeters and get installed on the internal networks. Um, generally speaking, the stuff that we can connect to our networks today is untrustworthy. And I include by that my own laptops. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying this is just your whatever uh, IoT connected refrigerator uh, at home. This is uh, everything. It's, um, I'll come back to that also. Uh, what I do, therefore, and what a lot of enterprises do, uh, is they allow some kind of traffic and deny the rest. Uh, or, rarely, they will deny some kind of traffic and allow the rest, but uh, generally speaking, it is seen that the operator of that network has a say as to what that network is going to carry. And this has an important implication, because if you get uh, infected by some malware and uh, somebody decides that, uh, gee, you're DDoSing them, actually it'll be the, the little camera, the baby monitor that you have uh, facing down into the crib to see to make sure that uh, your, your baby is, is breathing peacefully. That thing joins botnets and you as the owner of that device and the operator of that network are responsible for the harm that it causes even though you don't have any control over what it will do. So the firewall is where that control gets instantiated. Um, so this means all we can look for is uh, normal traffic and non-normal or anomalous traffic. And uh, this is not a good state to be in. I am, I am not painting this as the place we would have wanted to go if any of us had been asked. This is where we are. Um, now, a nation state actor, and this could be an authoritarian nation somewhere out in the world, or it could be maybe your own national security agency in, in your country of origin, um, they want the privileges of managed private networks even for public networks. They want to be able to monitor. Uh, in fact, they want to be able to surveil. Um, and in some cases, some authoritarian nations that we can all think of offhand, they want to filter. They want to say, nope, you're not, you're, you, that packet is not going to get out of the country because of where it's going. Um, these are prerogatives of managed private network operators that are being usurped by other agencies. Uh, and if you usurp a prerogative, you will cause a counteraction. And this is that counteraction. If these privileges had not been abused, this protocol might not now exist. And you know, I wish that people uh, in positions of power over nation state actions uh, would consider the, uh, the, the, the law of unintended consequences, uh, but they don't because they'll be retired by that time. So um, these sites, you know, what we call managed private network in the old days was uh, this is a site, this is my site on the internet or the ARPANET or the NSFnet or whatever it was, um, cannot be secured. There's just, there's no way to secure the devices connected to it. And what we do, as I said, is anomaly detection. And uh, that is to say, we look at the signals that that device is generating, and from those signals, we try to guess, uh, is it aware of my policies? Is it trying to follow my policies? Is it <laughs> ignoring my policies? Uh, and based on the level of cooperation that you can tell by how it behaves, you decide whether you want to keep it or not. Um, I've, uh, I have rejected medical devices that wanted to come into my house because they had their own LTE modems. Uh, they, because I am an unreliable ISP in general. If you're a medical consumer, uh, they really, really can't depend on you to allow your data to get back to whatever medical supplier you have. Um, and that's just, uh, that's all we can do. I just want to say again, if we had thought this through at the early days when the internet was not so entrenched and we tried to come up with a solution to this problem, this would not have been it. Um, on the other hand, if we tried to come up with a design for the internet, we'd still be designing it instead of using it. So uh, I understand why this is so. I just want to make it clear, nobody would have picked this path forward. So um, it's worth mentioning, just in passing, uh, this audience is certainly aware that um, your, the laws that govern 
your patch of dirt that the particular nation whose boundaries you are operating within um, are different in various ways from the laws that apply elsewhere. Um, so the internet is global, but laws are local, which means that laws don't really intersect with the internet very much. Uh, the person who is trying to hurt you is probably not breaking the law where they are, or if they are breaking it, they know how to break it successfully. You're not going to be able to get recourse other than in giant cases of you know the, the great bodily harm. Uh, you simply won't be able to get cooperation at scale for the every minute of every day crimes that are being committed because those crimes are not crimes everywhere. Uh, this is a necessary and predictable uh, behavior for the internet. Uh, we, knew, we could have known this was coming. Now, um, let me throw a bone to those of us who write software. A lot of it was bug free. Um, but some of it wasn't, and at scale, the law of large numbers begins to apply. Um, there, were, there are bugs in all software, as far as I, can, I am concerned, because there always has been. Uh, we have had to send patches to very expensive space probes that were orbiting other planets in the solar system. And the QA budget for the code that went on that launch was as big as the entire uh, gross GDP of some nations. But it won't help because complexity, uh, it's a little bit like uh, inertia in, in heat systems. It always increases. Uh, layering uh, is a way to push the dangers of that complexity out of your part of the solution, uh, but it makes the solution in, in, in toto, more complicated. So it's good for the maker, bad for the, for the, the user. Um, and so there's, there's just no way to model any of it. You have no idea uh, whether you have the thing that will get its own web, web page someday, the way Shellshock did, uh, present in devices that you're buying, uh, even if they're fairly expensive, you know, laptops or whatever, um, because there's too much software. There's no way for to, to possibly understand how it's going to interact. And patches then are, give you constant churn. So if you could get a point in time and say, ah, I've, I've successfully, I've got a supercomputer, I've successfully modeled uh, my environment, um, that would last an hour. And then your model would be out of date. And that won't change. In fact, that's going to speed up. So the best we ever get is a confidence interval. Um, we are safe from a certain amount of known defects because we patch the heck out of everything. Um, but this, we, we know there are unknown defects. We just don't know how bad they're going to be and whether I'm going to be, whether it's going to be Friday night and I'd rather be with my family when the zero day comes out. Um, finally, let me uh, point out another eternal property of the security industry, which is that. Um, Breaking into things is a profit center for attackers, and also red teams, but in particular attackers. Uh, preventing those break-ins is a cost center. Um, profit always uh, beats um, sort of uh, just cost. You would much rather make money than save money. So uh, the bad guys are always going to have better incentives than the good guys, to the extent that there are good and bad, rather attackers and defenders. Um, that, you know, that will not change unless we replace our global society with something based on DNA that is not ours, because this is who we are at scale. That in turn means that if you're going to defend your network, you're going to be breaking rules. Right? Firewalls were not part of the original internet model. The expectation was we had these huge computers in the data center, mini computers, mainframes, that kind of stuff. Uh, there were very few of them and they had a lot of expert operators and so they could be expected to uh, be kept safe. Now that turned out to be false. Uh, anybody who went through the 1980s knows sort of how many times mini computers turned out to have you know, stupid flaws in them. Uh, see the Morris worm, for example. But it also turned out not to be a scalable proposition because now we have tens of billions of devices. You know, we have a lot more devices than we have people. Uh, and that trend will continue. 
and a lot of this stuff is out of date. Uh, was a lot of the stuff was out of date when you bought it. So, um, if you want to defend yourself, you're going to have to do things that were not in the rule set. They're not in the RFCs to have firewalls originally. Um, and you'll be breaking rules, and you're, what you're doing is you're looking at the packet flows. You're trying to understand what the distributed system is trying to do now, and is that good or bad? And if it's bad, how do I stop it? Um, now that just, as I said earlier, it turns out that everything a site security administrator wants to be able to do, an authoritarian government also wants to do. Those two actors are indistinguishable from the point of view of a protocol. So, if you are, as I say here, a passionate defender of human freedom, and you see this type of abuse, it's hard to just sit down and put up with it and say, well, I guess that's the way the world works. It's, and if you and a couple thousand of your friends all just think it's time to put an end to this and uh, move to a post-national phase of uh, human history where end users are in charge of everything and we have autonomy uh, down to the individual level, um, that will conflict with the needs of a site security administrator. Uh, and that site security administrator is bound by the law of the market, which requires that their network be not understandable. You with me so far? These requirements are all inevitable and they are in conflict. So after Mr. Snowden made those disclosures, uh, the IETF more or less set its hair on fire and said, uh, something's got to be done, we have to encrypt everything. And um, this got all the way to the top level of governance there, the Internet Activities Board, Internet Engineering Steering Group, uh, the members, the working group chairs, everybody got on board with this or they got driven out. So there are two RFCs which I suggest you not read during the coffee phase of your day. Please uh, read them in the wine or beer phase of your day because I fear for your blood pressure. Um, RFC 8890 is especially notable uh, by saying the internet is for end users. Um, in other words, we intend to disintermediate every, everyone else. All right, so if, check for me if you want to. You can just uh, take a moment right now, check your head. Feel the back of your skull. If you find an RJ45 jack, raise your hand. If you don't, then the internet is not for end users. The internet is for the devices that we communicate through. So RFC 8890, in its correct title would be, the internet is for surveillance capitalists who manufacture our devices. <laughs> because they didn't leave any carve-outs in any of their thinking or any of their directions to working groups or RFC authors for the idea of a uh, managed private network or a site security administrator. It was assumed that everybody who was on path who wanted to interfere uh, had to be stopped. Period. No distinctions. So. Um, if you have an intruder, well, they are an end user, so the internet is for them. Um, sorry that they're in your network, sorry that they're in your server or wh wherever they are, but we're going to make sure that you cannot tell they are there by looking at the behavior of that server. That sounds insane. You may think this is an April Fool's joke and I'm here on the wrong day. It's not. It is insane, but it's also true. So. I participated in some of these working groups, and I took exception to the language here that's in bold, where they're talking about the quick wire image. That's like what the packet looks like in TCP dump or Wireshark. Um, the wire image is not specifically designed to be distinguishable from other UDP traffic. And I took exception to this, and we had a whole email thread where, where we argued it through, and I lost. What I wanted was for it to say, the quick wire image is specifically designed to be indistinguishable from other UDP traffic, because that's both true and it is what is recommended by RFC 8890 and RFC 7258. So this feels dishonest to me, but I lost that. And so if you read RFC 9312, this language is unchanged. I'm not sure what that means about the psychology of the internet protocol development community other than it's clearly human. 
Uh, another RFC has to do with DNS over HTTPS. And here, the boldface text is that uh, these use cases include preventing on-path devices from interfering with DNS operations. Well, guess what my firewall is? It is an on-path device. Guess what it does? It interferes with protocol operations. That's why I have it. But um, it turns out that, uh, again, no provision was made for the idea that some networks are managed and private and the devices are untrusted and the software on the devices are untrusted and it is the uh, operator of what used to be called an autonomous system but is clearly no longer autonomous. We're all sort of part of a great blob. Um, those operators are not expected to be able to uh, control what their network does. Um, now I want to say uh, my day job announced a few days ago some security controls so that uh, an, uh, some instance, some uh, cloud guest uh, inside of our cloud, um, if it starts doing DOH, then that'll trigger an alarm, unless it's configured to be allowed to do that. And the reason is if you are uh, a bad guy and you are breaking into things, and you know that the DNS server, uh, DNS resolution path of the thing you broke into is well monitored. And whatever lookups you might do while present in that system are going to be monitored and could potentially trigger problems, then yeah, you're going to use DOH. And yes, there is malware already in the world and has been for the last year that uses DOH in order to bypass the DNS level detections that are kind of the heart and soul of NDR. Uh, and I mean, I realize Yara is also important, but Yara is also going over the side when uh, when Quick comes, because uh, no no form of packet inspection is going to be meaningful at that time. So, just to mention performance briefly, I know this is not exactly the right audience, but at the moment we've got load balancers that can see the TCP header, which includes various things like the window scale, and. Um, those load balancers are capable of perturbing these numbers as the packets pass through them in order to get certain things to slow down and other things to speed up. Well, in Quick, none of this is visible at, at, uh, to any, of this, any such load balancer or, or middle box. If you didn't participate in the key exchange and the setup of TLS 1.3, then you will not know what the parameters are of the conversation which is taking place through uh, your own presence in, in, in the graph. And since I mentioned TLS 1.3, I do want to say some of this is coming even for HTTPS over TCP port 443. Uh, TLS 1.3 supports something called encrypted client hello. It used to be encrypted server name indicator. Um, the, basically, the, the, vir the, the name of the virtual host you want the web server to act as when you connect to it used to be in clear text. Um, now it's not. And that means that if you have a next-gen firewall, um, for you know, possibly because your uh, regulator requires you to have one, uh, you can no longer tell when something on your network makes an outbound TCP 443 SYN packet, in other words, let's, let's talk, uh, you can no longer tell what it intends to speak to on the other end. You'll know the IP address, but that IP address probably supports millions of different names. And if you can't see the name, you can't have a rule about which names should be specifically allowed or specifically denied. This is not an accident. Again, uh, people who want to do that include nation state actors. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. So there are no good choices. We're about to see some bad choices made. Um, one of them is to do nothing and let all this happen, uh, in which case next time somebody says, hey, how come you spammed me? You'll say, I have no idea. I'm not responsible for the traffic that emanates from my network, and I resent the implication that, that I ever could be. It's all encrypted. I can't see it. I couldn't stop it. Um, why are you bothering me? Um, so doing nothing is, is one of the choices. Uh, you could also say, nah, 
I've got regulators. I've maybe you're a government contractor, a government agency, uh, or you're just um, stubborn. You might say, no, we're not doing that, and we're going to do what Vixie's been doing for 30 years now on every network he's ever operated, which is that we're going to deny UDP by default unless it is going to a known protocol on the outside and coming from a known IP address on the inside. Um, a lot of people have told me this is uh, nutball stuff, and it certainly breaks online role-playing games. Uh, so my children have a particular thing they have to do if they want to make one of those work. But um, this is going to be quite common, because allowing this to just happen and connect any actor, software, hardware, personal, inside your perimeter to any actor on the outside uh, will be an, an intolerable risk to some. Um, you might also say, okay, we've had a proxy, like this next-gen firewall I described, that was trying to interfere with TLS startup when it could see the server name indicator, but now we can't see it. So you no longer get to send your web traffic to the outside. You have to send it to the proxy explicitly. You have to agree to trust the key that that proxy is going to offer you, and then you have to talk to it, and it will make all of your stuff into clear text in order to apply what may be regulatory policy enforced by governments um, to the traffic. And if it decides that you're allowed to do it, then it will regenerate your session to the outside as your explicit proxy. This is going to be a firestorm. A lot of people are going to complain about this. In fact, there is no path from here where a lot of people are not complaining about it. Um, that's, uh, that's our brave new world. That's our next thing. So, what's the impact on those of you who would uh, like to be able to torture malware, find out what it's doing, you know, disassemble it and uh, run it in the emulator and all the rest of that stuff? Well, the malware now has a new game, which is that it'll come with uh, its own crypto in user mode that uh, will generate these opaque blobs, which will be passed to the kernel over a UDP socket. And so stopping it from making a connection will not be possible unless you first stop it from generating the keys and participating in the key exchange. So you're going to have to start your breakpoints a lot earlier than you do now. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to tell what it's doing later. Malware has rights. And, um, you know, I will say there's a silver lining. Uh, malware often refuses to start up if it thinks it's in an emulator. Um, there's a whole uh, cat and mouse game that goes on between the reversing community and the malware community. Uh, because the malware does not want you to be able to tell what it's going to be able to do and then, you know, uh, break down the botnet as a result. So uh, the things that a firewall operator will have to do to defend themselves are probably going to look to malware like it's you trying to reverse engineer it. And so it, a lot of malware is just going to stop starting up because uh, it can't tell the difference between that firewall and a... Uh, Thread researcher. So the internet is a network of networks. And that was written on a cocktail na napkin in 1969. And the idea was we'd build these autonomous networks, and they would each have some resources, some users, whatever, and then we would connect them together into this big internet thing. OK, and this is what it looked like, is anybody along the path between where the request is coming from and where it's going, uh, would have a chance to say, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, maybe I don't want you to send spam. You can't connect to TCP port 25 from here or something. And um, this was not a great system, but it, it was evolutionary. It got this way, you know, along a certain path. And I can certainly think of some things we could have done differently and earlier that would uh, have improved things. It wouldn't have been this, by the way, uh, because now, we don't have that. What we have is we want a dumb pipe. We want every actor, including our own operating system kernel, uh, our firewall operator, our CISO, our regulator, the ISPs, we want everybody to see nothing but 
random noise, random looking noise. And um, this means it's no longer, a, the internet is no longer a network of networks. Uh, it is a network of human eyeballs to be monetized. And the people who want to do that uh, are in no mood to put up with, with our, our crap. So if you've not heard of Shoshana, I urge you to uh, go get this book and read this book. Um, and I'm only going to point to this one quote, but uh, she predicted all of this before Snowden went to, uh, went to Hong Kong, before the IETF set its hair on fire. And I'll just read this out loud. The challenges of epistemic justice and epistemic rights in this new era are summarized in three essential questions about knowledge, authority, and power. Who knows? And who decides who knows? And who will decide who knows? Who decides who decides who knows? This used to be up to us. Um, it turns out we looked like bad stewards. So if we have time for questions, I would like to get some. We can take a couple of questions. No coffee break. If you won't ask a question, I'll, I'll, I'll twist Ben's arm to ask a question. Ben, take it away. Oh, wait a minute. Thanks, Paul. Um, I, I, interesting points about Quick and, and the internet. I, you mentioned firewalls. Um, I've always, and maybe I'm just too young for that, but I always think of firewalls as some outdated thing, and the right way to do it these days is to just uh, have an end-to-end, -end, a point-to-point, -point, like a firewall decrypts everything, decides what to do, and if you don't want to do that, then you let it pass through, then you should not visibility. Is that not the internet that's we should be striving towards. If you have like an, an enterprise, then the firewall should see, should either see everything, if you decide you know you want to do that, or it should see nothing and not some kind of well, we encrypted it, but we leave some domain names in, in the headers. I think that is a reasonable design, and that we could have aimed for it all along, and we could have aimed for it as part of the change to Quick. Um, however. Uh, I was a lonely voice having that perspective in that room. Most people don't believe that giving anybody that power could possibly be safe. And um, let me say in particular, if you've got a toaster uh, that you know has got shell shock problems and it's very likely to join a botnet and, and you know be spamming on command, um, we don't have a protocol whereby that toaster can be told what is the name of the local proxy and what is the key that you must trust? So a lot of us said, well, we have DHCP and it's extensible. Just add some more TLVs in there and that'll tell the toaster. Well, if that were possible, and it's not, and I'll tell you why, but if that were possible, we have a long tail. Uh, that toaster is going to last 10, 20 years. And the company who made the IP stack for it is already out of business. But it's not possible because DHCP is itself not secure and the IETF intelligentsia refuses to allow anything that is to be used for secure pur security purposes to be delivered by an unsecure protocol. And so first we would have to design a secure protocol and then we would have to outlive all of the existing toasters. And no one really thinks that that is a way out of the mess that's going to come in the next two to five years. Thank you. Okay, last quick question. Yeah. Quick, quick. A quick question. Hey, so you mentioned that uh, there's a many to one mapping uh, basically with IPv4 and uh, domain names, but uh, with the upcoming <laughs> large deployment of IPv6, how do you see this uh, uh, ev uh, evolve then? Because, of course, IPv6 could be a uh, Pretty unique uh, mapping. 
Well, so IPv6, having as it does all those bits for addresses, um, usually uh, the convention is, you don't have to do it this way, but the convention is that 64 bits describes the network you're on and the other 64 bits describes you as an entity. And famously, there are devices, for example, an Apple iPhone, which are willing to simply take a different bottom order 64 bits every once in a while in order that its previous activities cannot be cross-correlated by um, various entities uh, with subsequent activities. Um, I know one person in the motion picture industry who wanted to use the bottom 64 bits to number the specific frame of an MP4 file that you wanted from a file server. There's a lot of things you can do once you have 64 bits of host address space. And to your point, that could mean that we don't need a many-to-one mapping anymore and this thing with encrypted client hello would go away by itself. But there's no reason to think this. It could be done that way. If you were going to start a web services company, you'd probably do it that way. There's no reason for Akamai to change what they've been doing, or CloudFront, or uh, Cloudflare. Or, you know, if, if what you're doing with this many-to-one thing is working, you're probably going to treat IPv6 as kind of the same thing but with more bits, rather than an opportunity to do things totally differently. And given that at least some large actors like some of the properties of this many-to-one, we know that it will not be the norm. And if it's not going to be the norm, it's not a solution to this problem. All right, I'm getting the hook. Let me just say uh, one more question, but uh, then you're, you're going to drum me off the field. Uh, ben and I will be here all week, and uh, we'd love nothing better than to talk more about this. So uh, please do. Last question. You seem to be, is this on? Okay, you seem to be describing the status quo of you can see everything, you can see some things, or you can see nothing. We're removing the you can see some things option by this. Do you see any path to getting that back? So, that's actually an incredibly long uh, question, although it sounded short. <laughs> and um, to, a path to getting it back would mean something I could do, uh, or that we, as a room full of people, could go do, that would you know, lean toward one possible future among the others. And the answer to that simply is no. Um, because there are a lot of people not in this room who really like the properties of this system. Uh, but what this leads to, and the longer answer that I won't try to give now, begins by saying that um, the only reason anything ever happens is because of a gradient. And the gradients that matter economically are making more money or saving more money. And so you have to find a way to put what you hope to do in the form of one of those gradients and then figure out how you're gonna sell it to the audience who will either make or save that money. And I don't know how to do that, but it's, we have until Friday, let's work it out. Thank you all again. Thank you.